Hello, good evening, and welcome to today's session on BIC Streams in collaboration with the Association of Designers of India. Nakashima at the National Institute of Design towards Environmental Histories of Design in India. Nakashima was one among the many renowned designers and educators who spent time at the NID. His engagement and collection left an indelible influence in the Institute, not only by the furniture pieces itself, but also on the designers who worked with him and in the pedagogic processes of the furniture design program, which remains one of the core design programs offered by NID. Joining us today are Tanishka Kachru, Senior Faculty in Exhibition Design, National Institute of Design, who will be in conversation with Vishal Kandelwal, PhD candidate, Department of History, History of Art, University of Michigan. Before I hand over to our speakers, we will be sharing their full bios in the chat box that you see at the bottom of your screen. Do post your questions, comments, and observations in the Q&A box, which is next to the chat box. With that, over to you, Tanishka. Hi, good evening to you all. And uh, thank you, Raghu, for this invitation to present my work and reflections on the Big Streams platform and uh, also to ADI for partnering on this event. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen. Yeah, before I, uh, uh, I start off into the presentation, I would like to uh, start with telling you a little bit about uh, how I started this research. It was in uh, 2012, actually, that um, Christine Guth, uh, who is the, was then the head of uh, Royal College of Arts Design History Program, shared with me a set of letters between George Nakashima and Gira Sarabhai, who we lost recently, unfortunately, um, which uh, Christine had obtained from the Nakashima archive in New Hope. And this is what set me off on an investigation of a part of NID's design collection that till then I had only known about in passing. Uh, but of course, I'd admired very much whenever I encountered it, um, you know, in a colleague's office. Because you see, uh, the furniture designed by George Nakashima is not just part of NID's design collection, but is also very much in use in some of the faculty offices in NID. So it's very much part of the environment. And if you're working at NID Ahmedabad, you encounter it almost on a daily basis. So uh, this exploration took the shape of an exhibition uh, that opened in the design gallery at NID Ahmedabad in October 2016. Um, and it was beautifully designed by my colleague, Jonah Das, in a way that the materials, except for printed panels, were completely reusable. And uh, we were also able to make a catalog book um, which was co-edited and beautifully designed by my colleague, Adira Tekiwetil. Uh, we received great encouragement from then director, Pradyumna Vyas, and were also advised by the well-known furniture designer, uh, Mr. Shrikant Nivtarkar from Pune, who's an alumni of NID's furniture design program, and also well-known for working with wood. And he had visited Nakashima workshop a few years ago and was very, very supportive in uh, you know, working on this. So um, the other thing I should tell you is that the exhibition, here are a few images of the things that I'm talking about, uh, was generously supported by Pidilite and Asian Things. And so we were able to produce several outreach programs, including a joinery workshop for students. Uh, we really wanted to do a Japanese joinery, but it was really, really hard to get an expert, uh, you know, locally who could teach that. And for a while we tried, you know, getting, thinking of getting somebody from Japan, but eventually it didn't work out. Um, but, uh, you know, they studied the joinery of the furniture that Nakashima that was in the collection. Um, and uh, we were also able to um, uh, have a furniture design competition. And here you can see George's daughter, Mira Nakashima, sort of going through some of the entries in the competition. And, um, we were able to have a workshop at Carpenters eventually, which was also very exciting. And 
uh, a symposium for educators and designers. Um, at the symposium, we were very fortunate to have Mira Nakashima, um, George's daughter, also a well-known designer in her own right, who has been running the Nakashima workshop since her father's demise in 1990 at the age of 85. She was a keynote speaker and we were also we also had Kosuke Nagami of the Sakura factory in Japan, which I shall tell you a little bit more about later. Uh, and his visit was generously supported by Japan Foundation. Uh, but I would like to tell you that Sakura is the only other makers of Nakashima furniture outside of the United States of America. So um, my engagement with these um, histories has led me to contemplate many questions over the years. Uh, but the one that I would like to focus on today um, and reflect on through this talk is how do we connect the deep histories of materials to cultures of design and consumption? And to explore this question, I'll be looking at 1964 as a historical moment that catalyzes several trajectories of design at NIB and its pedagogy. I will be presenting a few of these trajectories um, as intersections with Nakashima's practice and material philosophy. Um, so Nakashima's, George Nakashima's work is described by the Museum of Modern Art in you know, their online collections catalog. Uh, and uh, MoMA is the world's leading design museum in New York. As I quote, a synthesis of old traditions with modern requirements. But in my mind, this description doesn't do justice to his deeply environmental practice. The practice of making furniture in wood by Nakashima was directed at the attitude of um, giving a second life to a tree. And his book, The Soul of a Tree, um, has inspired many others to do as he did. For him, I feel, um, a good design remains a good design, um, no matter you know, uh, what changes happen and uh, in, in trend. And he rendered this type of inherent honesty in his work uh, by taking up woodworking as a revelation process with a series of consecutive judgments at the right stage. He believed a piece of wood itself reveals what it wants to be when you engage with it. And um, in her book, uh, his daughter Mira uh, Nakashima, uh, in a book, Nature, Form and Spirit writes, I quote, uh, his acts of creation relied on a deep understanding and respect for the nature of wood itself. They also required an unerring focus away from the egocentric concerns of Western culture, a mentality, that is at best an anachronism and at worst an ongoing battle against modern society. In um, around 1982, he actually fulfilled his dream of visiting a, seven, a, a tree that's thought to be 7,000 years old. And that's the image that you're seeing. Uh, I'm sorry, his face is a bit blurry in this image, uh, but that is him, trust me. Um, and at this, at, at an age of 75, he climbed the mountain, which is about 6,300 feet above sea level where the tree stood. And uh, uh, to visit this you know, magnificent uh, 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 cedar tree in the Yakush Yakushima forest in Japan. It's a very, uh, you know, sort of a unique place. Uh, and later he wrote about this experience, I quote, uh, it is an awesome phenomenon that a single unbroken stream of life juices has coursed through its cells with countless great cultures and civilizations have come and go. Taking this idea of wood as a living being ahead, uh, Nakashima's furniture was designed to gracefully grow with the normal wear and tear that's incurred to a furniture by living with it. Um, and he uh, very fondly, you know, he calls this um, Kevinizing in honor of his son, Kevin, who sadly we lost just last year. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I really feel this 
this work of his can be seen as an embodiment of his dedication devotion concentration and love for wood expressed through selection of right material mapped to a fitting design to render grace beauty utility choice and instinctive tuning of tools setting up of a crisp joint ability to gauge tolerance of wood to fit a joint selection of right adhesives and finally the finishing to bring out the true depth in grain executing a joint to perfection sits at the core of nakashima's furniture and he's very well known for some of his joints this not only pronounces the excellence of his furniture but also serves as like a spiritual training for the workmen producing these pieces uh during the 2016 events in amdavad i had the opportunity to uh, meet and you know have conversations with meera's husband meera nakashima's husband jonathan yarner who also uh, came to amdavad with her and uh, he shared with me that he had been making the same chair at the nakashima workshop for 20 years and i was stunned you know how can you make the same thing again and again for 20 years he simply said that it was like a meditation for him so um coming to how george nakashima came to the nid um but uh, before that i'd just like to set the scene of you know what it meant um he came to nid in 1964 when it was still known as the national design institute and um this was just sort of 3 years after it was set up in amdavad uh, it was a very important year uh, the iconic nid building was in process of being designed and built as a collaborative effort by the founding faculty led by gira and gautam sarabhai the founders and 1964 also saw the arrival of several leading figures of international design fraternity you know very important modern designers from all over the world at the newly formed institute so this is a moment when multiple strands of influence in the form of educational philosophy design practices making practices and aesthetic ideals came together to shape and mold the nascent indian design education uh the design archive and collection at the nid and conversations with many ex faculty alumni and designers who witnessed the making of the nid in the 1960s has greatly enriched my understanding of these historical circumstances that shape this moment and i feel that allows me to examine micro narratives in these anecdotal histories uh in my mind um uh, you know george nakashima plays this kind of central role in introducing an idea of design and craftsmanship at this moment uh that uses the traditional hand making skills of the indian carpenter in combination with knowledge of industrial production methods and this coming together of uh you know seemingly at odds value system in a deeply harmonious practice of woodworking is a significant contribution to what made nid a unique pedagogical experiment uh so here on the screen you know you can see a letter that gira sarabhai has written to nakashima uh, after he's left uh she's apologizing for not being able to see him off because she was a bit unwell and uh, you know she's also talking about how the furniture pieces that he had sort of been working on during his brief two to three weeks visit are um almost ready and you know she describes it as a handsome collection um and uh she also says that uh, by the 10th the eats party will have be gone and then we can probably relax and start working on the furniture problems in earnest and what she's referring to as i was saying you know this this moment when we have many forces uh coming to nid 1964 is the eames office um working as consultants for the very important nehru exhibition uh because remember that 1964 is also the year that um jawala nehru passed away and immediately indira gandhi commissioned a traveling exhibition to be made at nid with the aims of consultants 
So, you know, on the right, we have an image which uh, with the Gira of Sarabhai is in discussion with Deborah Sussman of the Eames office and um, an artist, Hakusha, who was also employed at NID from 1962. And we'll hear more about him later. Um, uh, and uh, so this, um, uh, so this moment, you know, is uh, is really important to explore. But to understand what shaped uh, Nakashima's practice, I would like to give you a glimpse of his life and background briefly, especially for those who don't know of him that well. Uh, so he's born in a place called Spokane, which is in Washington State, which is the uh, western, northwestern coastal Pacific coast of the United States of America in 1905. And he was a son of Japanese immigrant parents, Katsuharu and Suzu Thoma Nakashima. Having decided to study design, um, he received a BA degree in architecture from the University of Washington in Seattle in 1929 and a master's degree in architecture from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, in 1935, I think. After working for a few years as an architectural designer in New York City, he decided to spend time traveling. And between 1933 and 36, he resided briefly in Paris before continuing to Tokyo by way of North Africa, China, India as well, I think. And in Tokyo, he joined Antonin Raymond's architectural firm and volunteered to serve as a representative uh, for the office in the design and construction of the ashram of Sri Aurobindo in Pondicherry. Within a week of arriving in the ashram at Pondicherry, um, George Nakashima became a disciple of Sri Aurobindo and was given the name Sundarananda, which literally translates to one who delights in beauty. Sri Aurobindo established the ashram in 1926 with his disciple Mira al -Fasa. Uh, after whom George named his daughter. Uh, and she's known to the devotees, of course, simply as the mother. Together, uh, they guided the spiritual community that included followers from all over the world and commissioned, they had commissioned a dorm, dormitory building to house the followers. Uh, funds for the building were donated by Sir Akbar Hyderi, Prime Minister of Hyderabad State. And therefore it was named Golconde after the famous diamond mine. Nakashima spent three years as project architect, developing the construction methods and details for the building, which is really one of the remarkable and earliest examples of use of concrete in India. And there's a wonderful book about it also authored by Pankaj V and uh, Christine Muller. During these years, he kept a diary of the construction process. Uh, keeping a diary was actually a method followed by many members of the ashram as a way to communicate with the mother. And, uh, you know, they would submit it to her for commentary. Uh, I would like to read you one entry. Just a picture of furniture, the interior of the one of the rooms at Kolkonde. Right. Um, so the entry that I'd like to read you is here. Uh, even during my fever, there was a fine feeling of strength entering my body. But these last few days, there has been a deep feeling of melancholy overcoming me. It usually makes me want to withdraw into myself. As a young boy, at such a time, I would go into the forest or mountain or lake alone to try to find the answer, writes Sundarananda. The mother responds, try to find out the peace, strength and light that are behind the superficial melancholy and you will make a big spiritual progress. So what is George referring to, uh, you know, uh, his sort of time as a boy uh, is really interesting for me because uh, Washington State is uh, where Nakashima grew up, uh, consists of very deep temperate rainforests in the West and mountain ranges in the West, Central and Northeast parts. Uh, these forests of this region, which is generally known as the Pacific Northwest, contain more evergreens than almost anywhere in the United States. And evergreen trees are really special because they do not lose their needles uh, during, many of them do not lose, lose their needles during the fall, the autumn. Uh, 
And Washington's forests are home to about 25 native species, uh, including you know, such magnificent uh, species as the Douglas fir, hemlock, the ponderosa pine, which is uh, you know, considered the tree of the state, white pine, spruce, larch, and cedar. Growing up in Spokane, you know, um, George Nakashima was close to the forest where these trees grew. And he writes in his book as well about roaming the mountains um, as a young, young person. However, uh, as while he was working um, in, um, uh, in, uh, in Pondicherry, second, the Second World War broke out. Sorry, I'm just going to go back a little to this image, yes. And what happened was, um, as the war broke out, he was in a quandary and eventually he decided to move back to the United States. Um, he also got married in the meantime and um, uh, his daughter, uh, Vera was born at a time when the family was eventually interned in Idaho at Camp Minidoka. The camps are a sad legacy of how American Japanese were treated as enemies during the Second World War by the Americans. Uh, in the camp, uh, he met master carpenter Gentaro Hikogawa, and uh, together using wood scraps and desert plants, they worked to improve their staff living conditions. And the image that you see here is actually from you know, that time. Um, however, a year later, it was his former employer, Antonin Raymond, who came to the rescue and sponsored the family's move from Camp Minitoka to Raymond's farm in New Hope, Pennsylvania right the other side of the uh, country on the east coast by 1944 the young family moved to a small house in new hope where nakashima continued designing and making furniture in 1946 he met um, furniture maker hans noel and agreed to design a mass-produced line of furnishing his furniture making business was well established by the 1950s when he received the craftsmanship medal from the American Institute of Architects in 1952. And in, um, it was uh, in the mid-50s, around 1956, that uh, we see that uh, George Nakashima received an invitation from India to design contemporary furniture for the government of India's Scottish Industries Department. And the idea was that this furniture could be exported by India to foreign markets. Um, very interestingly, in letters between uh, bureaucrat Dian Sana and Nakashima, uh, he is invited to design modern furniture that can be made by woodworkers in Kashmir, uh, famous for its walnut uh, carved uh, wood furniture. And um, to entice Nakashima to come and you know, do this work in Kashmir, they even offer uh, to pay him in wood saying that he could select pieces of walnut and any other wood from Kashmir as his payment. And um, this to me is really interesting and uh, because in uh, her book, Nature, Form and Spirit, Meera Nakashima also writes about how her father uh, would spend money. Her mother was sort of, you know, she would control how money was spent. And, uh, but she would never object when he spent money on wood. Uh, she would never let uh, him or even Mira later, she would not uh, spend uh, allow spending of money on advertising and marketing, but um, you know as much wood uh, could be bought as uh, was needed and even more. Uh, so and Mira remarks that it at points it became very hard to imagine how to store the wood. So very unique form of payment that uh, was being tried to entice. George Nakashima to come to Kashmir. Um, he didn't make it though. And um, uh, however, Gira Sarabhai, uh, she was also in touch with him in the 1950s. And initially their correspondence was about a building that was commissioned by her family, the Sarabhai family from um, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, under whom Gira had actually trained in Taliesin uh, as an architect. And um, uh, this building was, however, never built. And this famous uh, sort of project, there's just uh, 
few drawings of it on paper. Uh, so later, she wrote to George Nakashima again in 1962, inviting him as a visiting consultant professor to the newly formed National Design Institute in Ahmedabad, uh, which she was heading, of course, at that time with her brother, Dr. Masala Pai. And after a series of correspondence, Nakashima finally agreed to spend about two weeks at the Institute in November 1964, on his way back from Japan to America. The terms of his contract were agreed in a series of letter exchanges yet again, and he was to provide designs for furniture to be manufactured in India, for which he would be paid royalty on the sale price. One thing um, important to mention before I go into the details of the furniture at NID is that during his 1964 visit to Japan, Nakashima had also visited uh, sculptor Nagare Masayuki, who introduced him to the Sanuki Minguren movement, also sometimes known as the Minge movement, which is a folk arts revival movement in Japan. Um, it was based on traditional values and spirit of Japan represented in its Wabi Sabi philosophy. This was a manifestation of, has been seen by historians as a manifestation of the global arts and crafts movement in Japan. Nagari had introduced Nakashima to the Sakura factory at that time, and uh, which is manufacturing furniture and interiors, uh, founded by Shinichi Nagami and Ken Takamatsu, um, not very far back in 1948. Uh, impressed by the woodworking technology of Japan, Nakashima entered into an agreement with the Sakura factory to produce and sell his furniture in Japan, which they, uh, the current generation, you know, supervises and does even to this day. So many of the furniture pieces, let me move the slide. Yeah. That he designed for production at NID were based on his existing designs, but some were also results of his observations of the Indian context and his collaboration with designers at NID uh, like Gajanan Zubagdhyay. Jiu, as he is fondly known, remembers learning about quality of wood from George Nakashima on their visits to lumber yards in Ahmedabad. Eventually, uh, the furniture that is produced in Rosewood is sourced, which was sourced from uh, forests near Mysore and bought wholesale at auction and transported to Ahmedabad, uh, was, you know, uh, the remarkable quality of the uh, furniture that's produced in NID that it's all in rosewood up to the time that it was in production uh, till about 1974-75. But the sad reality to note today is that when you, you know, go looking for these forests, they are hugely depleted and um, you would not find any rosewood trees in what remains. And uh, believe me, we attempted to actually, I sent uh, uh, I re requested a student uh, who lived close to my store to go and investigate if these forests are still there. And, uh, you know, what he found was just uh, very sad. So, um, and that leads me to think about, you know, modernist design. Modernist design was premised on this kind of rigorous separation of spheres, especially the spheres of nature and culture. The representation of nature as other is, of course, a Euro-American modernist construct. This concept of othering, you know, whether we have acknowledged it or not, has been intrinsic to modern design practice as well. If a general disregard for the many material, spiritual, and more than human networks that one is inevitably a part of is what has led us here, then what can the question could to ask could be, you know, what can lead us out of it? And I believe that you know Nakashima's practice points to such a direction and offers an alternative pathway. Uh, here you can see, you know, 1964, uh, around 1964, I think, um, the NID library, while it was still in Sanskar Kendra, which is uh, the building across from the NID campus where it was housed while, you know, the building construction was going on. And of course, this is the iconic building, um, designed as a museum for the city by um, Le Corbusier. And in the corner, and the reason I'm showing you this photograph is because here in the corner, it's quite dark, but you can see uh, that this is actually one of Nakashima's designs, this chair here. So, 
So while my ID hosted a slew of international designers and is associated with, you know, mostly with this kind of top-down designing as recommended by many of the international experts that came from all over. Um, I, in my mind, there is also a turn to vernacular design cultures and pedagogy in the early days, which I feel is important to examine. And while the objective of the Institute as set up by the Indian government was to produce an industrial modernity that would allow the nation to compete in the global marketplace. However, we can see the role of these individual actors and their interaction with local and global networks important to understanding the shaping of a polyphonic institutional narrative. I contend that Nakashima's work shows us how vernacular processes of knowing and making have and can shift design practices. This has a deep influence on the pedagogic developments at the NID. Um, before I go on to these trajectories, I'll just quickly uh, take you through uh, some of the collaborations. So the conflict chair, which um, was a collaboration by, with, between Nakashima and Gajanan Dupaghe, was one of the pieces of furniture which they made together in uh, during his short visit in 1964. And later, uh, GU made drawings for this furniture piece as well, as you can see here. Uh, it's one of the pieces which is actually in teak wood rather than rosewood because they made it, you know, before they uh, the decision to uh, produce in in rosewood was taken. Uh, this is the cabinet that goes along with the table. You can see uh, George Nakashima's, uh, you know, stamp here, Nakashima Woodworker, New Hope. And um, what NID did was to actually produce a catalog because uh, as these were in production, uh, they were also for sale. And here uh, in this page from the sale catalog, you can see that um, chest that goes along with the convoot blood chair uh, illustrated right here, uh, of which you saw the drawing earlier. So, and uh, this is another piece which they made together, uh, a coffee table, uh, and it has the signature butterfly joint um, tie, again made of teak wood, uh, because this is before the you know, production for sale started in 1964 in collaboration with Kajanan Zapanke. And uh, this is the famous grass seated chair uh, being made in the NID workshop in 1965. Uh, it's quite an in interesting image uh, as you see, uh, you know, the, the beaving being done and uh, empty chairs in the background waiting their turn to be woven. Uh, this is a chair that he had actually designed earlier um, at a time when you know he didn't have access to a lot of materials and he uh, he had used rope uh, even in his original design to weave the chair and um, um, you know this chair was also shown in one of the good design exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art, which took place in the 1950s and became quite iconic. Um, and uh, yeah, and one of the interesting things, uh, outcomes of this, you know, the fame and the, of this chair was that uh, while we had the exhibition in 2016, somebody was so enthused by this chair, one of our visitors actually took one away with them. And uh, the chair became front page news on uh, all the newspapers in Ahmedabad. Um, I also want to draw your attention to this chair. Now, uh, you can see this here. Uh, it's a low seated chair, quite low. And Nakashima was thinking about, you know, postures and how Indians uh, in India, how we sit close to the floor. Uh, and it's also a chair to sort of sit back in comfortable. Um, he had sort of designed it in the United States and it came with these cushions on it, which are made of sort of rubberized foam. And there is a correspondence between Vira Sarabhai and Nakashima where they're discussing, you know, what, how to replace that rubberized foam with a material because that material was really expensive and would make the furniture 
completely inaccessible to most people if they use that? And how would then they replace that material to uh, produce something that is um, you know, cost friendly? Um, this is a, a lovely photograph of Vikas Satsalika, former NID director who we also lost last year, frankly, uh, using the trestle table and uh, you know, the grass seated chairs for visitors in front. Um, so you can see it has a really kind of a period feel to it. So uh, coming back to, you know, thinking about the trajectories and departures and uh, that emerge in NID. Um, one of the early departures is made by Hakku Shah and Eberhard Fisher uh, with their work at the NID research cell. Uh, Hakku Shah was appointed as a researcher in July 1962 and you saw him you know, earlier in that photograph with uh, Deborah Sussman uh, from the Eames office along with Gira Sarabhai. He was made part of the research team for the uh, exhibition as well in 1964, the Nehru exhibition. And uh, later he was part of researching and authoring the first books which were published by the Institute on Ethnography and Craft. The first one is Matani Pacheri, which he authored with American writer, Joan Erickson. Unfortunately, he's not credited as a co-author on this book. And the second one for which he is credited is called Rural Craftsmen and Their Work with German art historian and ethnologist Eberhard Fischer, uh, which was, uh, the research was done in 65, 66, and it was eventually published in 1970. Uh, Fischer uh, went on to become director of the Museum Rietberg in Zurich and continued collaborating with Hakusha even after they both left the NID. Um, they worked together to put together uh, exhibitions of Indian art and craft over the next couple of decades, which were shown at the Rietberg Museum. Uh, the museum itself is known for collecting and displaying Asian, African, American, and Oceanic art, and seems to have de developed a particular interest in craft and materiality through none other than Johannes Itten, who was master of the preliminary course at the Bauhaus till 1923, when it was still in Weimar. And uh, he was the first director of this museum in the 1950s. Through the archive of uh, you know, this uh, book, Rural Craftsmen and Their Work, we can now begin to see their work as an anthropology of living condition. Fisher and Shah spent much of 1965-66 in studying rural craftsmanship in the village of Ratari, which is located in Southern Gujarat in the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Saurashtra region. Alfred Bruller, who's also a very well-known anthropologist from the University of Basel and known for his study on Patola of uh, Patton, uh, noted in his preface to the book that it should be considered as an example for similar future publication and encourage the Institute to keep documenting crafts. Fisher and Shah's methods of documenting technical procedures and the material equipment for what they call traditional rural design through a combination of photography, drawings, maps, and text, became the paradigm of craft documentations produced by the students at NID in the 1970s. They used a classification based on materiality to develop a picture of the whole environment. And it's important to note that unlike the design students, their work did not include a study of the economic relationships and the framing of problems. Uh, Haku Shah was deeply influenced by Gandhian thought and practice throughout his life. And growing up close to Bardoli and Vechi Ashram, both set up by Gandhi, he spent time working as an art teacher after completing his BFA from the Faculty of Fine Arts of MSU Baroda in the mid 1950s. Um, his body of work and scholarship clearly foregrounds this idea that the knowledge system of the traditional craftspeople is as valuable as the training of the modern designer, and both should be given equal standing. Another departure um, that is made much a little later in the uh, foundation program, uh, which drew on the pedagogies developed at the Bauhaus and uh, Ulm, 
uh, half shul ul but also made diversions in response to how the leadership and the teachers at the institute perceived the needs of the developing nation gautam sarabhai wrote and i is concerned with the quality of the physical environment and its relevance to human need uh, and he wrote this in the structure culture document uh, published in 1972 the document was shaped by his interest in psychology organizational behavior and education uh, brought up in his uh, you know progressive wealthy family of industrialists uh, they had hosted educationists like maria montessori in 1940 uh, the psychoanalyst eric erickson and ak rice of the tavistock clinic in the 1960s as well it was about a decade after sarabhai's document that uh, a teacher in nid's foundation program mohan bandari wrote uh, a paper called foundation program at nid and approach in 1983 Uh, having studied in detail how the educational philosophy outlined in the sarabhai document melded with the ulm expert suggestion bhandari then proposed a radical departure from this he included environmental exposure with the city as a real life classroom emphasizing that this must happen in their education in the form of a formative stage before entering the stage of training for a specialized type of professional expertise uh, so students chose a micro environment in the city and conducted a detailed ethnographic study of the non human actors shops homes places of worship and the human actors you know women men children the old the homeless and so on and their interrelationships this environmental exposure course also later took students to rural areas within the province of gujarat and similar ethnographic studies were also carried out there Bandari also proposed ending the foundation program with a course wherein the students are introduced to design methodology which incorporates an individual designer's questioning attitude his sense of social commitment and his value system in general hopefully honed by the exposure to the city and village in court this study of environments and habitats in the interplay between human and non-human actors initiated a shift in practices through the next couple of decades however hakusha's position of giving equal standing to the training of the modern designer and the knowledge system of the traditional craftsman was a little bit too radical for the design school as designers began to see documentation and design anthropology instrumentally as a method for finding problems and you know this is the 19 as we move into the 1980s this design for development kind of uh um, becomes the major concern in nakashima josh nakashima's work we recognize craftsmanship as a practice by which he realizes something important to him a value laden picture of the world of crafts shows us the focus on qualities of various kinds like the qualities of products of work but also of the environment in which the producers and co-producers operate that renders their activities meaningful so um to conclude um i'd like to uh, sort of um, you know mention anna singh uh, an american anthropologist who argues in her book the mushroom at the end of the world uh, published in 2015 that thinking and mobilizing the activity of redefinition is necessary for collaborative survival in the face of capitalist devastation uh sing sings work in a broad sense is largely founded on redefining the pre- prevailing political problems of the anthropocene the end of the world has already arrived but in placing uh the matsu take mushroom at the center and following its life line she illustrates that at the world's end we have new beginning it is here with the beginning of the matsu take at the end of the world that there is room for imagining other worlds she says and um you know in my mind in seeing trees as living beings nakashima rejected modern design concerns with scalability and efficiency and he saw what thing calls the possibility for imagining other worlds thank you
Great, um, if I may. Thank you for a wonderful presentation and talk, Tanishka, and also for the great anecdotes along the way about Nakashima's engagement with India, both uh, during the 1950s, 60s, as well as uh, in the current uh, day and age through the exhibition that you showed us. The work you have shown us today contributes to important discussions about the place of the natural and human environment and environmental concerns within design thinking in the academy and beyond. It highlights the role of history writing and historical interpretation in thinking about how humans engage with the environment and with what one might call a materially conscious way of living. And this, as you've mentioned, seems very pertinent in our hyper consumerist present today. You've also shed light on the contours of modernism and modernist design in 20th century India and their relationship to earlier modes of making, living and thinking. And here one example would be the kind of environmental thinking that was encouraged at the Vishwabharati University in Shantiniketan, Bengal during the early to mid 20th century about which we've also heard from Ushmita Sahu and Mortimer Chatterjee at an earlier BIC talk on Within Mazumdar. Lastly, your work draws attention to the varied networks, as you mentioned, of individuals involved in creating and asserting, as well as sustaining this modernism in India, including but not limited to Gira Sarabhai, Pupul Jaikar, and Komla Devi Chattopadhyay, some very well known and others little known within scholarship on design history. So without further ado, I'd like to pose a few questions to which you may respond. And then I'd be very happy to serve as the moderator for questions from our audience today. Yeah, great. So the, the first question that I had is, could you tell us a bit more about the, so you mentioned the Mohan Bhandari's work on environmental sensitivity. And uh, I'm thinking here about the legacies of the kind of thought that Nakashima uh, asserted at the NID. So could you tell us a little bit more about how Nakashima's work during the 1960s at the NID might be related to what Mohan Bhandari did uh, in the 1980s? Do you see similarities, uh, differences, and how are these moments related to each other? Um, thanks, Vishal, for that question. Um, I think, you know, uh, Nakashima, through his action, sort of advocated living close to nature. Uh, and uh, you can see his development of land around his studio and home shows how he sort of continually searched for ways to integrate humanity and the environment harmoniously. And this, this kind of attitude that, you know, this idea I see in the environment perception course um, uh, in, in trying to understand these relationships and networks and also the students were encouraged to um, understand these socially historically as well mm -hmm. uh, so they were supposed to be you know sort of reading around uh, what they were observing so it was uh, observation reading discussion right uh, and observation through also through drawing and sketching um, so and that to some extent con continues even today in mm -hmm. NID. Mm -hmm. But I feel that um, one of the sort of dissimilarities that you know, one finds is that eventually, you know, uh, the, in the way that modern design functions, right, as um, a profession that sees itself as a problem solving uh, sort of uh, profession, right? Uh, the the young designers the you know they they start searching for problems and uh, especially in the 80s as you know the idea of design for development and we see this uh, unido exit conference a really mm -hmm. important conference happening at nid in 1979 it's, it's the first united nations conference on design uh, also co-organized with what was then known as ICSID, uh, the International Council of Industrial Designers. So you see this whole uh, you know, network of international uh, designers again coming to NID and uh, they're all 
many of them are coming from the west but also from you know the global south we also have participation in brazil and south africa but mm-hmm. there is uh, um you know this this idea that designers can contribute to development uh through this identification of problems so that is where i feel it kind of diverges mm-hmm. um and in what nakashima is you know sort of aiming at is a little different in terms of um his idea of developing this understanding uh he sees it as you know a kind of a progression towards a harmonious coexistence right as opposed to a direct problem solving mechanism is what you're trying to say which is more happening in the 1980s and 70s yeah, yeah. i i mean it, you can really see that emerge in the uh, i mean i'm i'm not saying that it wasn't there in the 70s and the 70s however the 70s had a slightly different uh, you know sort of narrative to it in the sense that in the 70s um as the uh, the program the the actual education programs were launched in nid in 1970 and before that you know the 60s is actually a period where uh all these forces are you know sort of coming together to actually develop this idea of design education and design practice uh and people were in an idea trainees rather than students um so when the education program is launched in the 70s there is a period when you know this it's just about actually stabilizing that program and uh the curriculum and uh there is less um and you know there is engagement the faculty members definitely have a, a lot of engagement with industry and uh also um a continue in producing craft documentation you know in the way that hakusha and eva fartisher show but the 80s are really about really where problem solving and especially problems of development you know uh, come to the fore yes right and you know related to fisher eberhard fisher and hakusha second question that i had was could you perhaps tell our audience and also me a little bit about how the work by individuals like nakashima uh, fisher and shah fell in line with broader ideas about national consolidation uh, in post colonial india through the crafts right uh, outside the design school as well yeah um that's a, that's a really good question vishal uh, because you know we do see uh, during that time um uh, especially through the kind of program of exhibitions that is developed at nid this kind of contribution to um this idea of you know the nation right the uh, building a national identity for india and in nid this much of this is enacted through exhibition yeah. um and outside of nid as well you know we see the formation of these new institutions for example the uh handicraft museum in delhi it sort of comes up in the 1950s uh the establishment of the you know uh the handicraft and handloom export council um and there is this idea that um you know craft um the cra- that uh, craft actually skills can be mobilized in producing uh economic benefits uh, for the in, for india right mm-hmm. uh, and you can see that in the attempt to actually invite um international designers well known modern designers to come and you know design in india which could be then produced by the uh, craft people of india and could um you know um add to india's gdp and mm-hmm. these attempts you see later as well you know the festivals of india also mm-hmm. are a series of events through which these ideas of national identity um and uh, nation building are enacted where uh, indian designers are put to, and indian craftsmen are put together with western designers to produce um you know goods for the global market yes and we see you know exhibitions like the golden eye uh as sort of a major sort of 
produce a major space for these enactments to happen. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I, I just also recall that in uh, 1982, actually, the Festival of India in Britain, which was the first of the series, was one where NID was actually asked to design and curate a design exhibition. And that was perhaps the first modern design exhibition uh, uh-huh. from India that was you know, shown globally. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see uh, the catalog of that exhibition where you know, a range of things were shown. Mm. Uh, which in, included both industrial processes as well as craft processes. Uh, so you can see this sort of coming together even uh, in the design exhibition that NID produces. Absolutely. And it'd be so great to maybe think of comparing that with the 1959 Design Today in America and Europe exhibition that really kickstarted a series of furniture at the NID that then became a teaching collection for the Future Institute. Um, so it'd be interesting to contrast the 1959 show and what it showed uh, with say what happened in 1982, as you're saying. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. And then later, uh, but another interesting thing is happening in the 80s is that, you know, um, at NID, uh, with the craft documentation, you know, people are starting to work with bamboo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are some interesting developments there that I, I would like to share. And I have a few slides on that that maybe I'll just quickly pull up. Um, one second. Yeah. So um, uh, what we design is, of course, key to how to live sustainably. And, uh, you know, crafting something from clay sets you in interaction with soil that is teeming with microorganisms, most of which are invisible to us. And bamboo has, of course, been praised for its tolerance for marginal land, making it a very good candidate for afforestation and carbon sequestration. Um, It has a wealth of local significance in places and uh, where it's been grown for centuries. And designers in NID who were, you know, sort of trained um, for, uh, you know, observing material culture and these traditional craft practices uh, in the 70s also started to um, meticulously record, you know, uh, these using expressive sketches, diagrams, photographs, field notes. And um, this method, in fact, is applied to the study of bamboo in the 1970s and 80s by faculty members uh, like Aditi Ranjan, uh, N.P. Ranjan, Neela Mayer, and Gansham Pandya, who published uh, a book called Bamboo and Cane Crafts of Northeast India, which is based on this fieldwork that they carried out actually in 1979-80. And this uh, work was actually sponsored by the All India Handicrafts Board. Uh, eventually, this inquiry led to experimentation with models for sustainable development. And here, you know, I, I have also also on this side, uh, the seedlings of wealth model produced by MP Ranjan uh, in his uh, uh, report, uh, which he uh, produced for the UNDP called Land to People. So Ranjan proposes a model using bamboo for sustainable human development. And uh, this eventually also feeds into creation of education institutes like the Bamboo and Cane Development Institute and Agartala BCDI. And uh, you know, exploration of bamboo ray had really taken off in a big way um, with you know, the education institutes coming up, but also proposals for urban market linkages and design interventions uh, planned by faculty and students. And eventually, a center for bamboo initiatives was set up in 2001 at NID under uh, Ranjan's leadership. And it became a hub for projects, research, promotion activities, and introduced a generation of NID designers to work with this material, both in the field and in the workshop. So, you know, we have a range of approaches to bamboo actually that develop. It's a very interesting area of study. Um, for anyone who's, who wants to look at these different trajectories of design history through material, you know, the material itself kind of produces so many different responses. Yes, no, absolutely. And 
Um, on that note, I think we can turn to the audiences because one of the questions uh, that I'm seeing here, and I'll just go in order. So one is, did Nakashima uh, influence this anonymous question, influence contemporary furniture designers in India? And um, this is another one related to that question, and you can take them together. Are Nakashima's works, philosophies, and methods integrated into present day learning of furniture design courses? This is by Rabindra Vasudeva, oh, Vasavada, sorry. Uh, okay, I'll try to answer both. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Nakashima was hugely influential, I think, in India also because of his association with NID. So uh, as you mentioned, Vishal, uh, you know, the design collection at NID has always been a study collection. Uh, so generations of furniture designers, even though they don't have direct contact with, you know, these iconic designers, Western designers or whoever is in the collection, they've always managed to kind of um, un try to understand their methodologies through direct study of the furniture. So this collection, you know, is regularly used in classrooms and, uh, uh, you know, there are drawings available for students to study. Students make their own drawings. They also, you know, use the method of replicating the master's work, something mm. that's also used in fine arts, right? You make these kind of replicas of master work as a way of studying and learning, uh, you know, the nuances of the craft. So, uh, so in fact, we have several replicas also, in, and it takes a good knowledge to understand, you know, which ones are the originals and which ones are the replicas made by students. Yes. Um, so, uh, so certainly, I think uh, that has been um, uh, quite influential. And I think, you know, uh, in the 70s, I mentioned Srikant Nevsakar in the beginning. You know, he is one of the designers in whose work you can see that uh, uh, that the ideas and the philosophy of Nakashima being an actor in the way he treats material and works with material. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I think materiality has been very central to NID. Um, and uh, even today you can see, you know, there are certain departments which are uh, still around, uh, sort of formulated around the understanding of the material. So whether we have textiles or we have ceramic and glass and uh, we have furniture, of course, furniture is not defined by the material, but I would say that, you know, till today, uh, largely, uh, students are encouraged to work with wood and, uh, uh, you know, bamboo. These are the two very uh, prominent sort of uh, materials. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, and 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 sorry, one more thing is the emphasis on joinery. So at NID, everybody, if you're a furniture student, then you know you would spend a semester actually learning about joinery and there's a huge collection of um, samples of joinery and I think that was really key to understanding Nakashima's attitude towards wood as well you know not just is the idea of selecting wood in a particular way uh, where he he sort of um, you know didn't really reject any piece of wood he called himself he's famous for uh, calling himself a rag picker so, you know, the wood that other people rejected <clears throat> or considered as waste, he would find ways to, you know, use. And uh, joinery was really key to that. So, uh, you know, the butterfly joint especially, mm -hmm. um, it sort of helps uh, put together two pieces of wood, which, you know, without forcing them to come together. Mm -hmm. So you all sometimes see, you know, two planks, which are sort of going off in different directions, but they come together with this butterfly tie somehow. And I also read somewhere about, uh, in one of the articles in your book, your and Adira's book, that um, the butterfly joint was also used as a kind of functional joint, right? Even though it had this kind of beautiful name and idea, it's not something that Nakashima's furniture used liberally just because it's a joint. They use it for a very specific purpose. So there's this kind of... Yeah. <laughs> along with notions of beauty and use um, that go along with the furniture. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, today, you see the butterfly joint sort of being used decoratively, sadly, by many people. 
uh, but for nakashima it wasn't so you know he he used it like you said functionally he used it only when he he needed to two pieces of wood to come together without you know forcing them right right yeah and and on that i i can lead us to another question so there's a question that says can you tell us more about nakashima's philosophy of working wood as a live being even after a tree is cut the placement of timber in the same direction as it was growing the idea of being of how loads are transmitted in the tree before cutting are there more such examples and uh, the person says thanks for an excellent talk tanishka okay that's a lot of uh, technical stuff um i i wouldn't i wouldn't go into it in detail but um uh, i what i what i would suggest is you know to um pick up if you haven't read nakashima's book soul of a tree uh, it's a really amazing uh, fabulous piece of sublime reading uh, where he talks he sort of moves between you know his uh, talking about his philosophy of um how he sees wood uh, you know trees as a living being and uh, even after the tree is cut he sees life in the wood right uh, and he talks about this in detail and he also talks about um, you know how he approaches the cutting of timber uh, the placement of it and uh, understanding how the timber is you know uh, what is the uh, what the life of the timber has been you know uh, in seeing how you know it has been through a certain kind of history it has lived a certain kind of life in a certain environment and how that has impacted its grains and its you know its growth uh, he had a really deep understanding of that and his approach to you know using the timber would you know be impacted by this understanding mm-hmm. his book is a great read and would be a great place to start to understand uh, all of this mm-hmm. Uh, there's a question on the kind of historical trajectory of design education so the person says thanks for a great presentation and discussion how was formal design education and pedagogy in the 1950s and 60s a rupture from the more environmentally grounded thinking of the last decades of colonial india such as in sri niketan or kala bhavan in vishva bharati uh, for instance both gautam trained as a mathematician and gira were heavily influenced to turn to design architecture after their experience as teenagers with the interior work in the retreat uh, do you have a response to that tanishka about the kind of historical I'm sorry i couldn't hear that very well where is this who is this question by uh, it's the it's the one uh, subtanshi sanya oh, okay i see it okay yes i um saptarishi i i definitely i would you know um i would i would see it as a as a rupture uh, from the more environmentally grounded thinking that uh, you know um that shanti niketan kalam bhavan and you know tagore's vision um however i won't say it's a complete rupture and i think that's the argument that i'm making is that in nid you see several strands emerge at the same time so uh, you know while there is this engagement with highly modernist functional problem solving uh, you know design for industry for uh, development there is also uh, you know this engagement with uh, vernacular design design in the villages through the practice of craft documentation through the development of understanding of materialities and relationships between uh, you know human and material networks that the craft documentation actually um, brings uh, uh, brings to you know um, the designers uh, understanding of environment uh, and i think that has a impact as well so i would say i mean these are not like they they kind of parallel strand that sort of uh, you see in nid um and i think uh, so there isn't a complete rupture but definitely 
there are multiple sort of ways of thinking about design and of course nid is a you know government institution which is still is today supported by the state government so um the the kind of you know the agenda of nation building is also pretty strong in you know uh the way an id is set up and uh you know works in those early decades yeah uh that kind of borders on shehzada murthy's question how did the economic situation in india in 60s and 70s affect the pedagogy of nid was the curriculum developed in tandem with the government um to some extent yes uh, i mean the economic situation uh certainly impacted in many ways like i you know talked about uh the nakashima you know range of furniture actually had to be adapted for indian conditions and uh, you know so, uh, some of the furnishings that went along with the uh, uh furniture like cushions and uh, upholstery had to be actually adapted for indian conditions so that it could meet the kind of economic uh, price range that uh, the people who would be sort of purchasing this furniture would be able to afford and amdavad is a very interesting place you know a, a sort of a city between tradition and modernity and the 60s and 70s there were so many modern design institutions coming up in amdavad and i've interviewed uh, you know few uh, modernist architects who sort of working in amdavad at that time and how they saw an id and you know things being produced there and uh, they told me that uh, you know they they really loved the furniture uh, that every year an id had uh, a sale and you know people would come to buy the furniture it was expensive but they would invest in it and even those who worked at an id employees at an id they would be able to buy the furniture in an annual auction where it was you know at very reduced prices but still many and it was still you know a large part of their salary but many people chose to uh, invest in it um yeah i don't know if i've answered the question but uh, uh yes yeah. absolutely absolutely i think the question was about uh, the government and economics and absolutely uh there's another question on methods and approaches during the 60s and 70s by uh, anonymous attendee would you like me to read it out or can you i'm i'm just going to yes um design anthropology is still very much uh part of the training at nid and uh, the environmental perception course continues um this year of course it happened in lockdown and it was quite interesting um uh, the way the teachers who approached it uh you know they started seeing um they had students do an ethnography within their homes themselves and they had some really interesting outcomes from that as well um is this approach not relevant anymore in the post industrial revolution um i mean i think you know india still has a very uh, has a craft sector you know which is quite uh, well alive despite you know all the uh, sort of premonitions of doom and there is still a variety of sort of contexts and living uh, standards and lifestyles in the country uh, so uh, you know approaches where uh, designers actually spent time understanding these range of environments working you know understanding skills and these working practices uh is still very uh relevant uh even though we live in an age of you know ai and automation and uh you know uh so by of course the technology which has entered deeply into most regions but we still find that you know there are many times when um uh, situations arise where the best of technology cannot help you mm -hmm. and or cannot come to your aid so i still believe, i believe that you know these methods are still um, have their relevance yeah so 
Sarita Sundar says, more of a comment than a question. Do we see a uh, coming together today of what you say was earlier seen as a polarization between the idea of problem solving as an approach that took on a big direction in the 80s versus the return to a harmony with the earth as exemplified in Nakashima's work? No, thank you, Sarita, for that comment. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's exactly how I feel. Yeah. But there's another one by Mayank Seni, who is a woodworker based in Ladakh. And the question is how do you see the future of woodworking in India? both at hands of craftsmen and designers. Also, how do you suggest betterment in the present state of affairs? Wow, that's, that's a big question. I, I'm afraid Mayanka wouldn't be able to uh, come up with an answer. But I mean, I would just say that, you know, I think what we really need to look at is uh, the kind of practices that uh, uh, are being, you know, emerging, which show certain di directions, you know, I love the work of, you know, people like um, Sandeep Sangaru, who's based in Bangalore, and is, you know, one of those designers who uh, worked with Ranjan in the field, and uh, he's able to kind of work with both wood and bamboo, he works with wood also in, uh, in Kashmir, and I believe he's going to start in Ladakh as well. Um, so I see that this you know, designers and uh, woodworkers sort of working together uh, can, there they can be new models which can emerge, which was, uh, which could be, you know, help sustain this craft, this incredible skill and craft and technology uh, further. Great. And, and our last question for the evening, uh, because I think we're running out of time today, is how did George Nakashima evaluate the strengths and shortcomings of traditional woodworkers in India? That's a good question, actually. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the one thing that uh, is interesting about how NID was all set up is that uh, while, you know, the, the designers mostly came from I wouldn't say elite, but uh, definitely urban, middle class, and upper middle class backgrounds. It was the technical staff, right, who worked in the workshops, who ran, you know, actually uh, helped students uh, make their prototypes. And even till today, many of them come from the, you know, the traditional um, uh, craft backgrounds, right? They belong to those communities, whether it's uh, a sutar or a panchal, uh, metal workers, woodworkers, right? Uh, and, or a prajapati. Uh, so many of the staff actually who were part of the technical workshops were from those backgrounds. So in, so one can actually see NID as a setting, right? Where uh, these uh, people who are from traditional craft background come together with these designers who are being, you know, trained in modern design and um, possibly industrial production. But the methods and the skills that they use are still, you know, the craft methods and skills um, with, uh, uh, with, with the technology that is available. So actually Nakashima was very perceptive in understanding what were the limitations and what are the possibilities with the uh, with the, the skill that was available amongst the uh, technical staff at NIV. And uh, in fact, he made many modifications to the furniture to suit the production methods and the skills that were available in NIV. And I think he spent the best part of two weeks while he was here prototyping and working with the people in NID to understand what is really possible and what is, you know, is difficult for them. So uh, that's really evident actually from a close study of the collection and the methods used for production. Great. 
Hi, Raghu. Um, we're completely out of time, but um, I'm going to take the liberty, Tanishka. Um, we have a question from Hema Hatangadi, who's also you know, a board member of BIC. So uh, her question is, um, are wonderful pieces like that uh, destined to live only at NID and in museums and in books? Uh, great furniture is so difficult to actually buy and use in India. Um, and one ends up at IKEA or you know similar places. Um, so she asks if there are any steps uh, being taken to you know create better furniture, make them more saleable, and connect better with the market. No, that's a really good question as well. Uh, so what hope do we have of being better consumers? <laughs> um, I, you know, I mean, I think uh, there are many experiments and uh, many sort of businesses today that are actually in the furniture industry uh, where some really good furniture is being produced. I, I think, you know, we have to also, as, con as uh, consumers, we also have to um, sort of make those choices, I feel. You know, uh, it's, it's quite easy to fall back to something like IKEA, and, uh, uh, you know, say that we don't have a choice. And I mean, it's like Amazon, you know, till a few years, we were all going out to our corner store to buy stuff. And then, you know, Amazon comes along and we completely change our habits, right? Uh, not all of us, but many mm -hmm. of us. So so I feel that, that it's, it's there, it's out there. Um, you know, I, I've, there are some incredible handicraft shows that still happen in all the cities where um, traditional furniture makers from across the country come and sell their wares. Uh, and I've bought some really great pieces there. There are designers working who are producing uh, great pieces. Um, uh, Fab India has been a good, uh, a great, I think, uh, um, source for uh, sort of more, this sort of combination between uh, having traditional methods and modern furniture as well. Uh, so there are, there are things there we have to just make choices. Mm -hmm. uh, on that note, uh, thank you Tanishka and Vishal for this fantastic session. Um, it was especially fascinating to see how uh, NID developed its own methods, um, you know, over the years um, without uh, you know, which is sort of unique to India uh, without replicating existing or, uh, you know, other uh, Western sort of pedagogical practices uh, with the he help, of course, of pathbreaking practitioners like uh, George Nakashima. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you, audiences, for joining us. Uh, for those of you who um, are interested, uh, there is a beautiful book called Nakashima at NID. Uh, which you can order from uh, the NID Press, which has um, all the furniture, which is uh, of Nakashima's furniture that he created at the NID um, cataloged and named, and you know, you'll find all the information there. Uh, thank you again for joining us and have a good evening. Thank you, Raghu. Thank you, Raghu. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you.